here we go again. I think I figured it out. Okay, so. The judgment of taste is disinterested, right? Now, when he says disinterested, a lot of students get this confused. He doesn't mean not interested, okay? It's not that I'm bored. It's not that I'm not interested at all. When I'm looking at a work of art, I'm making something, uh, an aesthetic judgment, something beautiful. Uh, I have to do it from this disinterested position in order for it to be a purely aesthetic judgment, right, for Kant, right? When I'm talking about the beautiful itself, right? When I'm talking about something being actually beautiful, it has to be detached from its satisfying me, right? It doesn't mean uninterested again, disinterested. So here we go. Okay. We easily see that in saying it is beautiful and in showing that I have taste, I am concerned not with that in which I depend on the existence of the object, right? I don't need or desire it. I don't think it's good for this or that reason but with that which I make out of this representation in myself. Yeah, so I'm thinking, how does it affect me? Does it look well organized? Does it look beautiful? Everyone must admit that a judgment about beauty in which at least, sorry, in which the least interest mingles is very partial and is not a pure judgment of taste. We must not be in the least be prejudiced, but be quite indifferent in this respect in order to play the judge in things of taste. Now, Hume makes a similar point in his standard of taste, which we already covered in this class. I don't know, I might post a video, who knows? Um, got enough on my hands as it is, right? Um, so, you know, Hume talked about prejudices and, and all that, and they get in the way of, of uh, being a good critic and being a fair critic of taste, right? And, Hume, and Kant is making a similar point here, right? So this is where he gets into some, some terminology, right? So when he says something pleases you, when something pleasant, that's different than saying it's beautiful, right? Um, you know, so maybe you might speak in a different way. You might say that uh, uh, something pleases you, uh, something's beautiful, and maybe you use the words interchangeably, but he doesn't think that that's the correct verbiage here, right? That which pleases the senses in sensation is pleasant. Um, and he says here, uh, you know, again, he doesn't like this common misuse, he misuse of it. The opportunity presents itself of censuring a very common confusion of the double sense which the word sensation can have and of calling attention to it. If a determination of the feeling of pleasure and pain is called sensation, this expression signifies something quite different from what I mean when I call the representation of a thing sensation, right? So for Kant, when he says sensation is different. For in the latter case, the representation is for the object, in the former simply the subject, it is available for no cognition, whatever, not even by the subject that cognizes it. Um, you don't even know why you like the things you like. You just like them, right? The things that that, that, that that merely please you, right? So for him, he says, what, what, what he means by the word sensation, what we understand by the word sensation, is an objective representation of sense, right? And, and that, so it doesn't depend on me. It's not subjective in that, in that regard, right? Uh, we shall call that which must be always remain merely subjective and constitute absolutely no representation of an object by the ordinary term feeling, okay? So the green color of the meadows belongs to objective sensation as the perception of an object of sense. The pleasantness of this belongs to subjective sensation by which no object is represented, i.e. to feeling, by which the object is, is considered an object of satisfaction, which does not furnish a cognition of it. All right, let's break this down a bit. So when I'm looking at this field here, right? The green color of the meadow belongs to objective sensation, right? Now you might, if you're like some philosophy major, you might say, really, like, is the color green in the object? That's because that's what he seems to be saying there, right? D isn't the color the have to do with the refraction of light and, and all of this, right? So if you know physics or you're a scientist, you wouldn't be thinking the same thing. Well, Kant's meaning here is like, he knows that, right? Yeah, of course, I perceive it as green because I'm a human and I have 
the kind of eyes that, that will see it as green. If, if my cat was looking at it, she might not see that color, right? Uh, you know, there's someone who's colorblind, okay? Now, but, so, but, but the fact is, being the type of being that I am, standing in the position that I'm standing, looking at the field from the, 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 the angle that I'm looking at it, I'm gonna perceive it that color, right? And you would too if you were in my condition. That's an objective fact, okay? And that's, that experience would be something that would be objectively true for all people. Now, whether I like that color, whether it's good or I like it, you know, that is something that's subjective, right? And that's, that's a feeling. And, and feeling too, it's something that's unlike even a thought. It, it, it isn't even recognized as a cognition. There's no, there's no, you don't, uh, you might have a word for uh, pain. You have a word for um, love and hate and all these sort of feelings that you might have, but they're just words, right? They, they, don't, they don't approximate the actual feeling and experience of hate and love and pleasure and pain, all these sort of things. So, so that doesn't even, you know, the, the satisfaction that is tied to the sensation of green, if I am satisfied with it, uh, it's not even something I can even communicate to somebody else, right? And therefore, it's not objective in this, this Kantian sense. And if something pleases me, it's bound up with interest, right? I have an interest in it. If the field, the green in the field is pleasant to me, then that judgment is not a judgment of beauty, but it's, it's another judgment, right? It's, it's a judgment of satisfaction, of, of, of pleasure, of, of, of something that feels good. So a judgment about an object which I describe as pleasant expresses an interest in it is plain from the fact by the, uh, that by the sensation it excites a desire for objects of that kind. Consequently, the satisfaction presupposes not a mere judgment about it, but the relation of its existence to my state. So far as it, affect, as it is affected, as my state is affected by such an object. So, so when I make a judgment about the, the, the pleasantness of the green in the field, it's referring to my sensation of it, right? Hence, we do not merely say the pleasant that it pleases, but that it gratifies. I give to it no mere assent, but inclination is aroused by it. And in the case of what is pleasant in the most lively fashion, there's no judgment at all upon the character of the object, right? So I'm not thinking about it, you know, I'm not conceptualizing it, I'm not trying to understand what it is, I'm just directly, immediately perceiving the pleasantness of the object. Also, when I say something is good, that is different from saying it is beautiful, right? So not only is this, this aesthetic judgment of beauty different from the judgment of something being pleasing or, or feeling good uh, or satisfying, right? Uh, in, in that sort of crude sense of satisfaction. But it's different, when I say something beautiful, it's different than saying that it's good because he says the good, even the judgment of good, is bound up with some sense of interest, some interest, however slight, right? Um, this quote, right? Whatever by means of reason pleases through the mere concept is good. That which pleases us only as a means we call good for something the useful. But that which pleases for itself is good in itself. In both there is always involved the concept of a purpose and consequently the relation of reason to the at least possible volition, right? Something I could actually do. And thus a satisfaction in the presence of an object or an action, i.e. some kind of interest, right? So there's two types of good, or two senses, right? For something, right? And something that's good for something, right? Uh, it's good for me to eat broccoli in order to get healthy, right? And some things are good in themselves, right? Like healthy, being healthy is just good. It's just good to be healthy, right? Kant might argue that, right? It would be something that's good in itself. Why do you want to be healthy? Because I want to be healthy, right? Uh, for Aristotle, you know, happiness, right? Happiness is the self-determined uh, good, right? Um, both of these involve satisfaction, he says, and therefore interest, right? So, and even if I'm talking about something like that's a good uh, bicycle, right? Uh, I'm using this concept of what a bicycle is, and I'm applying 
this the, this concept to a particular example of a bicycle, and I'm thinking, okay, well, it's good because bicycles are needed for this, right? My conception of bicycle is something that's two wheels and people can ride on it and it's for transportation. And so if it doesn't have all these features or if it has them to some sort of um, uh, unsatisfactory or, or incomplete degree, uh, then it's not good, right? But if it does have all that stuff and it's functional and it does it well, then it is good, right? So all this is bound up with some sort of interest, Kant argues. But the beautiful, not so much, right? The beautiful is, when I say something's beautiful, it's not be not because it satisfies me, although, you know, we, maybe we use that word beautiful, uh, It's maybe it's changed, or, or maybe Kant, it, maybe, maybe people were using it the way we use it today in the 1700s, uh, and Kant is, is, is being a silly philosopher and, and, and sort of abstracting here, right? But he's going to claim in, in this passage here, uh, th there's something to it. Um, there's something intuitive about it. It sounds, sounds like he's you know, he, they're, 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 they're on to something here. When I say something's beautiful, it's not because just because it makes me feel good, right? And it's not just because it somehow fits some sort of expectation that I have that that object should meet, right? But there's something else that I'm, that I'm noticing, right, for, for Kant. She says, in order to find anything good, I must always know what sort of thing the object ought to be, i.e. I must have a concept of it. But there's no need of this to find a thing beautiful. Flowers, free delineations, outlines intertwined with one another without design are called conventional foliage have no meaning, depend on no definite concept, and yet they please. Satisfaction in the good must depend on reflection upon an object that leads to some concept, however indefinite. And it is thus distinguished from the pleasant, which rests entirely upon sensation. Right? So when I look at these flowers and I say they're beautiful, it's not because I'm ex it's like, oh, they, they fulfill my concept of what a flower should be, right? Or how flowers should be arranged, right? They're just, just the way that they are presented is just beautiful. Not because it, it, it fulfills a need of mine, not because it, it, it fits a concept of the way flowers should be arranged. Even if I'm walking through nature and I just see a patch of flowers that's not arranged all, you know, like this, and I notice beauty, right? It's not, has, it has completely detached from any of my interests, right? It's a disinterested judgment. He says, right? I'm just going to skip this uh, slide because I think we've, we've kind of made uh, the point, right? So, so we, we've sort of distinguished between these three types of judgments, right? We'll say something's pleasant. That's sort of like just this crude, immediate, I like it, it feels good. It's, it's uh, attached to a, a direct feeling of pleasure in the subject. The beautiful, again, this is something that's quite unique. Uh, that has nothing to do, it's not, it's not attached to a concept, and it's not attached to pleasure. Well, what is it attached to? We'll get to that probably in the next lecture uh, in more detail. We'll wrap this one up with kind of like a short answer. Uh, and then the good, right? So th these are all different, right? When we say something's pleasant, something's beautiful, and something good, that designates three different kinds of satisfaction, right? It, it designates three different relations of representations, you know, my experience, to the feeling of pleasure and pain, right? In reference to which we distinguish from one another objects or methods of representing them. That which gratifies a man is pleasant. That which merely pleases him, right? Not in a sort of like crude, uh, sensual type sense, like the, the pleasant or gratified uh, implies, right? But pleases in a completely aesthetic way, purely aesthetic way. Uh, and that which is, that, that is beautiful. Right? That which merely pleases is beautiful. That which is esteemed or approved by him, i.e. that which is accords an objective word, is good. Pleasantness concerns irrational animals also, but beauty concerns only men, i.e. animal, but still rational beings. Right? So we're the only type of beings, as far as he's concerned, uh, that are rational in this sense. We are the only ones that use concepts to organize our perceptions and to make these kind of judgments, at least in the sense that he's talking here. And so humans, not cats or anything else, we can make a 
aesthetic judgments of beauty. We can say something beautiful or ugly, right? But the cat, when they're looking at the screen, they're not thinking, what a pretty bird, right? Uh, they're not able to detach the reason that they're focused on. The, oh, wow, look at that high death. That's just completely replicating nature. No, they're not, they're not getting into that, right? They're just looking at it like it's just yummy, right? It's food, right? It's, it, it's something that I desire, right? And if I could eat it, it would gratify me, right? So animals can do that. They can't look at that bird and say, well, it's actually, look at the, look at the plumage on that bird, right? Um, so we may say that all of all these three kinds of satisfaction, the taste of the beautiful is alone disinterested and free satisfaction. It's, it's the one that is completely disinterested. It's not attached to a concept. It's not attached to my feeling, right? My gratification, right? For no interest either of sense or of reason forces our assent. Hence we may say of satisfaction that is related in the three aforesaid cases to inclination, right? That's when I'm just pulled towards something. I desire it, right? To favor, that's the that's the that's the beautiful, right? I just this is my favorite. It's just it's just better. I don't know why. I just like it. It's just it just it's the more beautiful one. And to respect, right? That's of the good, right? Uh, this is this is uh, the, the way that the this is the way a bicycle should be made. I don't know why I'm using that example, but now favor is the only free satisfaction. When I make an object, uh, when I when I claim the object's beautiful, uh, I, I give it favor. This is the only free, disinterested type of satisfaction. An object of inclination, right? Like you know how the dog is inclined to the pork chop, uh, is one that is proposed to our desire by a law of reason. It, it leaves us no freedom in forming for ourselves anywhere an object of pleasure. All interest presupposes or generates a want, and it leaves the judgment about the object no longer free, right? <clears throat> so taste for Kant, right? This is uh, not completely different from Hume, right? I mean, when Hume was talking about being a good critic, it just has a lot to do with what, uh, yeah, I think you can see a lot of parallels you can draw between the two, but he says taste is the concept taste is the faculty of judging an object or a method of representing it by an entirely disinterested satisfaction or dissatisfaction if it's ugly, right? The object of such satisfaction is called beautiful, right? And so that's sort of what we're gonna draw from all that's preceded, right? The sort of argument is that, again, judgments about beauty are different from objects about what gratifies us in that sort of way, that it satisfies us in that way and objects of good, right, that satisfy us in a sort of conceptual way, right? This is a different type of entirely disinterested satisfaction, right? And we have this uh, uh, illustration here from these old books of aesthetics from around the time of Kant, really. He, his theory really picked up, you know, uh, 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 a, lot of, a lot of converts, even during his own lifetime. And, and there were these sort of uh, uh, books, these proper books, a proper etiquette of how to appreciate art uh, in the right way, right? So you don't want to, you know, be all talky and getting into it and looking at the sculpture but instead, just in calm repose, right? Uh, in a sort of disinterested uh, fashion. Um, okay, well, let's, uh, let, we're stop the first video there. Uh, I'm gonna pick up sort of where we left off in part two. And, uh, you know, we're still on old material, but by the next video, I think we're going to get into some new material and hopefully it'll wrap up Kant in at least maybe two or three, two or three parts here, right? We'll talk more about um, what it means to be beautiful, what, what type of judgment uh, the, the judgment of beauty is, uh, and also Kant has an interesting theory about genius and what, what it means to be and an artistic genius. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll stop the video here and uh, pick up where we left off. Uh.